Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International news update. My name is Walton Pantland and with me is Lindsay Millen. Lindsay, are you playing with your iPhone 5? Yes, I am playing with my iPhone 5. Um, industrial unrest in China continues to proliferate. A riot at Foxconn factory that disrupted production at Apple's main China supplier for 24 hours highlights regimented dormitory life and thuggish security as major sources of labour unrest in China. While unrest often flares up in China as low-paid workers agitate for better conditions, the conflict at Foxconn's facility in northern China was notable because of its scale and severity. Um, details of the riot are uncertain while investigations are underway, but employees interviewed by Reuters said tension between workers and security guards boiled over on Sunday evening after a worker was severely beaten. That led to thousands joining in, and about 40 people were injured, according to Foxconn and Chinese media. It's a major blow to China's, to Apple's top supplier, as it ramps up production to meet orders for the iPhone 5 and seeks to re rehabilitate its image after a labour audit this year found flaws. Foxconn chairman Terry Gu has moved in recent years to improve conditions at the factories following a spate of suicides and pressure from Apple. However, workers say many changes haven't filtered through to the smaller factories like that one at Taiyun. Um, the factory has inferior food, poor sanitation and overcrowded dorms while security guards are young, untrained and too aggressive with workers comparing them to gangsters. Um, many labour groups see ultimate responsibility for such strains re rests with Apple, which they say puts profit above workers' welfare despite pledges to improve their workers' livelihoods and cut overtime hours. Um, New York-based China Labour Watch has said Apple sales and marketing strategy involves launching a product suddenly without much paying attention to inventory, so the subsequent product shortages help to build demand with little um, regard for workers. Um, livelihoods and places extreme pressures on them. Uh, Li Qiang, the labour activist, said workers at Foxconn's giant plant in Zhengzhou in Henan province were working largely on the iPhone 5 and were also facing great pressure with overtime of about 70 hours a week, despite pledges by Apple to cap work at 60 hours a week. Foxconn are in damage control claiming the unrest was triggered by a personal dispute that spun out of control rather than harsh conditions in the factory. However, I think this is really just a smokescreen to hide the real issues that workers are facing at the Foxconn factory. When a company has to force its staff to sign an anti-suicide pledge to work there, you know something mm. is far wrong. Uh, Foxconn was given a greatly improved bill of health by the Fair Labour Association. However, the association itself is industry funded and receives a large part of that funding from Apple. So it's a similar situation to that in Pakistan where the factories involved in the death of over 300 workers were given a clean bill of health from Social Accountability International. This goes to show that we can't trust industry funded bodies to monitor industry, we need independent assessment and the best way to do that is through trade union health and safety officials. Absolutely Lindsay. Um, in fact China is very interesting, we had a web conference recently with Eli Friedman of uh, Cornell University who spoke about the underreported worker unrest which is becoming common across China. That's going to be something that will be very, very important to watch over the coming years. But um, yes, that textile story, fashion is certainly brutal. The factory fires in Pakistan is one of the worst cases of uh, industrial accident, industrial death that we've seen in a long time anywhere in the world. And uh, this is a factory making jeans for the European market. So how is it possible that those kind of conditions uh, manage to manage to exist. Um, surely retailers look at their supply chains and consumers put pressure on retailers. Well, as Lindsay said, the issue is industry-funded bodies. Uh, in this in this instance, um, that factory was given a clean bill of health by an organisation whose remit is to check factories on behalf of retailers. And uh, once again, just shows you that you can't trust companies to police themselves. Um, in the same region, Bangladesh has won the race to the bottom in wages and has some of the lowest wages in the world. Uh, the, the low minimum wage for textile workers in the sector is $37 per month. Has this created a free market utopia, as libertarians would have you believe? No, of course not. Violent repression of workers' protests 
uh, has occurred as the police use violence to attempt to enforce low wages. It has also resulted in the murder of a trade union activist called Aminul Islam. And uh, his killers have not been brought to justice. There is a campaign on our website to do so. So please have a look at that and support the support the campaign. The important thing coming from all of this is that the vast amounts of money made in the fashion and textile industry are almost all made by retailers and brand owners and almost nothing of it goes to the people who actually make the clothes. And it doesn't have to be this way. The biggest textile union in the world is the South African Clothing and Textile Workers Union, SATWU, which has a bunch of really, really innovative strategies to make sustainable work in the fashion and textile industry possible. They work with industry, they work with designers, and uh, the result is that you can buy union-made clothes across South Africa um, which support good sustainable jobs. This is something we can do elsewhere by building links with organizations who are working in the sector. Um, for example, the UK Union Equity has created a union for models who are also part of the same sector and the same industry and are often exploited and uh, experience poor conditions. And there are a number of campaigns looking at the labor behind the label. So for instance, you can find out the high street shops, what conditions those clothes were made under. For example, did you know that Zara, the Spanish-based international clothing chain, is one of very, very few in the world that has signed an international framework agreement with a global union federation, in this case the forerunner of Industrial. What that means is that this company has committed to providing a living wage across all supply chains across the world. That is an important achievement and it's something that we can do more of if we coordinate the effort to stamp out the sweatshop conditions in, in the textile industry. Yes, and evidence from the US says strikes work. There's a fantastic article on Gawker about the success of the Verizon and the Chicago teacher strikes. It says that strikes work because they bring a powerful stakeholder to the table, the public. When negotiations involve only workers and management, management are free to simply stonewall the workers. After all, they're not the ones who will go hungry first in a standoff. However, when the public involved, the balance of power is completely redressed. When Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel has a million angry parents calling his office demanding that he fix the goddamn teacher strikes so their kids have somewhere to go all day, things change. The public wants things to work and their demand is fix it now. The pressure mostly falls on management. As well, they are concerned with PR. Unions are concerned with mm -hmm. improving the lives of their members. The Gawker article makes an interesting point. Um, strikes are the pinnacle of workers exercising their freedoms in a capitalist system. Restricting the right to strike is tantamount to forcing people to work against their will. And the working people of America, which is to say the majority, would be better off with more strikes, not fewer, because they work. Let's hope this message is carried like a flame throughout our own teachers in the UK who have recently begun their own campaign of escalated industrial action and a row over jobs, pay, pension and workload. Members of the NESUWT will produce only one written report a year, will not submit to lesson plans to senior managers and will refuse to invigilate mock exams. Union members will also only send and respond to work-related emails during work hours. How very dare they? The NUT will also take similar action from next week. Chris Keats, the General Secretary of the NESUWT, blames Michael Gove for the strikes, saying, in just over two and a half years, the actions of the Secretary of State have resulted in over half of teachers considering leaving the profession altogether. Specialist teachers losing their jobs, applications for entry into the profession plummeting, and teacher morale at an all-time low. The Secretary of State continues to fail genuinely to engage with the union, and continues with his reckless disregard of the deep concerns of the teaching profession. This is a betrayal not only of the workforce but of every child in the country. Resistance clearly does work as the teacher strike in Chicago shows and also a big strike uh, at Verizon, a, a communications company, mobile phone company. Um, there's been growing unrest and resistance in North America and it's really good to see those su successful strikes. The other example being the students in Quebec who um, put up a really, really good fight and now pay, pay the lowest tuition fees in North America, I believe. And it's a lesson which is being learned in Southern Europe as well. 26th of September saw a general strike in Greece against 
another insane round of austerity. People are resisting this fiercely. They're not going to put up with it. And uh, seeing the levels of resistance, I very much doubt that the Troika and the current Greek Conservative government will be able to force that austerity through. We've also seen a week of massive unrest and protest in Spain around similar issues as the, com- the country prepares to receive bailouts from the European Central Bank. And also last week, the Portuguese government was forced into a U-turn on an austerity policy that they tried to introduce after mass protest. Resistance works, austerity doesn't. It's really, really important that we get together and we collectively resist this insane policy of trying to get working people to pay for a financial crisis that they didn't cause. Moving to South Africa, we've had uh, terrible news from Namibia Uh, from our comrades at the Manufacturing and Allied Namibian Workers' Union. One of their head office administrators was murdered at work by her partner. So USI would like to send condolences to her family and colleagues. A really, really terrible story that, isn't it, Lindsay? Yeah, and it just again goes to show that domestic violence is a worldwide issue. Um, Partner violence accounts for a high proportion of homicides in women internationally. Between 40 and 70% of female murder victims, dependent on the country, were killed by their partners or former partners. The comparable figure for men is 4 to 8%. And it's just saddening that in many cases, women are at most risk of violence in their own homes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Staying in South Africa, Africa's biggest union confederation, COSATU, had its annual congress last week. Um, the General Secretaries Wenenzima Vavi and President Stumo Tlamini have retained their positions. This is interesting because there had been attempts to oust Mr. Vavi, who is sometimes seen as being overly critical of the government and is also seen as being a champion of the poor. Speaking at Congress, Vavi said that South Africa needs a Lula moment. He was referring to the former Brazilian president, uh, Da Silva, uh, known as Lula, who used state resources to lift huge amounts of people out of poverty and turn Brazil into a development state. And he's making a very valid argument that South Africa needs to do the same, to use the tremendous amount of resources that the country has to fundamentally shift the the economic balance in the country. Um, Kasatu also announced the launch of a civil society coalition for a free Palestine and explicitly made the link between apartheid in South Africa and the experience of Palestinians. Palestine is increasingly an important issue for unionists around the world, and indeed next month sees the start of the New York sessions of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, which is something like a a people's court looking at the issue of Palestine. And we'd encourage you to follow that because we think a lot of interesting information will come out of it. The Kasatu Congress comes at a difficult time for trade unions in South Africa because of the unrest in the mining sector. Uh, We all know about the massacre at Marikana and there are ongoing wildcat strikes at uh, a number of gold mines as well. The reason it's challenging is that the miners at Marikana won a 22% wage increase, which is an absolutely dramatic victory. However, they won it through wildcat action and not through traditional collective bargaining structures, which puts a lot of pressure on both the unions and uh, employers to to find uh, valid ways to to represent people and meet worker demands. Um, We had the good fortune last week of meeting a trade union activist from Zimbabwe, Tafadza Choto. Uh, Tafadza was arrested and tortured by Mugabe's police after arranging a meeting where she showed a video about the Arab Spring. And uh, there's an interview with Tafazwa on our website. We'd encourage you to, uh, to watch this and also to support the campaign to free the Zim6. There are six Zimbabwean activists who um, have charges against them for this treason charges at one point, and there's some very, very serious charges. And uh, we'd encourage you to support this. And uh, clearly, Mugabe is worried about an African Spring, and uh, we need to do everything we can to support our comrades in Southern Africa to return democracy to to their country. Um, In India, uh, as you'll know, we're working with Prior's Labour Centre to organise brick kiln workers, and that project has been going quite well. We had a a web conference with our 
comrades there recently and they told us about how successful organizing the brick kiln industry has been and how in many instances they've been able to double and uh, even sometimes increase wages by more than that. They've been able to bring education and, and child care into villages which didn't have it before. It's a very, very successful unionization program and they're doing very, very good work. Uh, this work is only possible though uh, with the funding that organizations like USI are able to provide and that funding comes from your branch affiliations. So if you've not already done so, we would encourage you to affiliate your union branch to Union Solidarity International and that money will go to supporting union organizing efforts in India and in other parts of the world where workers need better representation. Once again, thank you for watching and listening to this Union Solidarity International News Update.